Thank you very much for joining us again this afternoon. It's been a fantastic day so far. There's been lots of really good talks and really good questions. And I'm really excited to be here this afternoon with Dr. Dowling. And we're going to have two sessions, one on small molecules and then on research directions in Canada. So um, again, thank you so much, Jesse's Journey, for putting this together and for allowing us to be able to talk about some of the really exciting things that are happening in Duchenne muscular dystrophy and lots of different areas that we are looking at to be able to look for modifying therapies in this disease. Here again are a copy of my disclosures. I'm the PI on various studies in DMD and SMA that are industry driven and um, any photos that are not in the public domain have been consented by families. So the aim of this presentation is really to look at the potential mechanisms for therapeutic approaches in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And as we've talked about today, it's really exciting to see that the more that we understand about this disease and the more that we understand about the root of the problem, the more opportunities we have to look at the roots of subsequent solutions. And really we're looking at how do we manage our Duchenne kids in this new area and age of innovation therapies and clinical trials and clinical care. And sometimes during these processes where so many exciting things are happening, but they're not available just yet. And that can be something that is very frustrating to our children and families. Some of the small molecules that we're going to be talking about and mentioning today include that of vomorolone and juvinostat and PTC. We'll also mention about edessa and adebinone, but recently those have not proven to be effective. And some of the other small molecules that have been used have been myostatin inhibition. People are still working on eutrophin upregulation and various other forms of immune modulation. And one of the things that we come back to and we really appreciate the input from our families so much is that without research, there are no new treatments. And it always brings me back to when we started doing some of these studies with PTC many years ago, um, one of my families at the end of one study had said, well, I'm really disappointed and it's like you've just given me the diagnosis all over again. However, what's the next study I can go into? And I really feel that it's fantastic that you support us in that way to move forward. So in 2019, this was the pipeline, and this has even moved further ahead than the phase three studies in that there are now some approved drugs. So there are numerous studies that are going on with various treatments, and we are really looking forward to having more positive results as we move forward with this fantastic potential. As we all know, DMD is an excellent recessive disorder affecting somewhere in the region of one in 3,500 live male births. And the, one of the big challenges, as we've heard from Dr. Mandel, is that this is such a huge gene and there are mutations in this gene and it's the size of the gene that has made it so difficult in the past for uh, gene therapies to occur. And dystrophin, as we know, provides structural support to the muscle fibers in the sarcolemmal membrane. And it links that subsarcolemmal sarcolemmal act inside the skeleton to the extracellular area. And it's that matrix via the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex that is putting the muscles to work. It's expressed in smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, as well as in brain. It's a multi-system disorder affecting numerous areas. So we've talked about the cardiac and respiratory ones today. We've not spoken about the cognitive problems and the increased likelihood of autism spectrum disorder or the behavioral and psychiatric symptomatology in this particular day. When we look at what potential treatments are available, it brings us to this very complicated diagram where because of the absence of dystrophin, it leads to recurrent muscle fiber damage with subsequent contractures so that inflammation and the response with fibrosis replacement by fat occurs at all these different areas. 
But these different areas of, of problems um, allows us to think of what are the processes in each of these areas that will allow us to be able to think of the potential for small molecules to possibly to be used together with some of these other treatments that might improve or reduce the inflammatory response, prevent some of the fibrosis from happening, prevent replacement by fat, and allow the muscles to continue working. And why, when we are looking at the uh, exciting potentials for gene therapy, are we still looking at small molecules? And really the reason for that is that gene therapy is still challenging at present. The dystrophin gene, as we've mentioned, is large. The immune system sometimes gets in the way um, as the body has not been used to the production of dystrophin or to because of the AAV vectors that are being used. Um, and we're just learning more about exosomes and whether these may be helpful to be able to look at some of the microdystrophin. And then we look at small molecules and we're looking at finding therapies that can possibly restore some of the muscle function without resorting to the gene therapies, that they can enter the cells and directly affect the target. And they may involve signaling of inhibition pathways such as in NF um, kappa B or with myostatin inhibition or antibodies to inhibit connective tissue growth factor or there may be upregulation of certain pathways. So adebanon was one that had been looked at, but others including upregulation of eutrophin or looking at post-transcriptional eutrophin upregulators or immune system modulators to alter the uh, inflammation and, and fibrosis. So in Canada, some of the studies that we have been involved with has initially been vomorilone, which is an exciting dissociative steroid, juvenistat, which is a histodiastase inhibitor and is working at reducing fibrosis. And then others like atalurin, which has been around for a long time and which has shown some benefits longer term. The mechanisms involved always come back to that initial dystrophin deficiency and the sarcolemmal disruption and an increase in intracellular calcium concentration, which causes that inflammatory process and muscle degeneration. And we want to try to prevent that from happening. And it may be as we go through the progression of what happens in the life of an individual with DMD, that there may be times where certain um, treatments are more beneficial than others. So that that early stage when we want to look at the possibility of gene and cell therapies and that later stage where we want to try and, and reduce the potential for fibrosis and inflammation. So these are really the areas that we're looking at. And the first drug that I'd like to mention would be that of Vomorilone. And the study has been VBP15. And it's the first in-class molecule of a steroid analog. So it's a dissociative steroid where really the top part of the molecule has been taken off so that it's based on a glucocorticoid, but it's no longer a glucocorticoid. And when we look at the group of steroids that we use, all 31 other steroid drugs are in the form of glucocorticoids. And Vermorolone is a different form of the steroid and it inhibits the NFKB reducing inflammation. It improves membrane stabilization. It appears to protect against dystrophin deficiency. And although it's got some of the same benefits as steroids, it also works differently from them. And it appears to significantly reduce the side effects. And as we were talking about this morning in our endocrine um, session, we talked about how almost all the endocrine problems that we come across in terms of growth, in terms of bone challenges, in terms of puberty, these are all really um, side effects from steroids. And yet the steroids help us so much in reducing um, the likelihood of requiring any intervention with respect to scoliosis or improving heart function, improving the length of time that you're going to be able to walk so that it's so important to us. And yet there are so many challenging side effects. So with Vomorilone, there appears to be less stunting of growth, less delay in puberty. 
there's about a tenth less adrenal suppression than in a regular corticosteroid. There is less immune suppression and less insulin resistance. And here we can see some of the activities that compares all the other corticosteroids, so whether it's prednisone or deflazacort, there's no difference in the potential benefits here and in some of the problems with the side effects. But vomorolone has some differences. So that when we look at the anti-inflammatory response with NFKB, they're both strong. When we look at binding to co-repressors that are required for anti-inflammation, vomorolone is actually stronger at doing this. When we look at some of the glucocorticoid um, receptor problems that we get into with corticosteroids, vomorolone is much less likely to use this. It's also less likely to bind to coactivators that are required for some of the transactivation. So it is also, uh, um, instead of being an agonist for mineral corticoid receptors, it's actually an, an antagonist. And it is um, helping positively in membrane stabilization. So quite a few differences in the activities of vomorolone as opposed to regular corticosteroids. And Dr. Hoffman has been instrumental in um, developing this molecule and the subsequent clinical trials. And um, we have been involved with some of these where, where between the ages of four and seven, in boys who are steroid naive, we have been treating some of these boys with vomorolone, and they have now um, finishing the initial part of that study and going on to the expanded access program. So in this initial study, there was uh, initial enrollment of 120 boys who were aged between four and under the age of seven who'd never been on steroids before. And they were divided into four groups. So it was either placebo, prednisone, or low dose or high dose of vomorolone. It's either two milligrams per kilogram per day or six milligrams per kilogram per day. And they were on that initial dose for the first 24 weeks. And then there was a transition period. And all those individuals who were not on vermorolone went on either to low or high dose vermorolone and then have continued on an expanded access program. And the primary outcome measures were time to stand and BMI. No biopsy was carried out. And the secondary outcomes have been safety measures, looking at various blood works, looking ongoing at the cardiac function, at DEXA scans for bone health, um, looking at the spines, looking at cataracts, doing a synaxin test to look at immunosuppression and, and what happens to your ACTH, looking at the time to climb, run, walk, the North Star assessment and myometry. And then there was a Canadian sub-study um, that was helped with Dr. Leanne Ward from Ottawa, looking at bone health and comparison of memorialone to the kids for the 4-DMD study, which compared prednisone and deflazacort. And here we can see some of the changes that were taking place. So the solid black line was the Synergy study, which was a natural history study of four to seven year olds with DMD. The small blue line at the bottom was those were the children on a very low dose of vomorolone. The, um, the, the, the more blocked out um, blue line at the bottom was 12 children again, was again a low dose of vomorolone. And then in the solid blue line um, above the Synergy study, one can see that those individuals who were on either two or six milligrams per kilogram of vomorolone had improvement in the mean velocity for the time to stand compared to the natural history study. Here is a graph uh, showing the BMI change. So looking at height and weight um, establishment, look at body mass index. And again, the one that had shown the highest BMI was that of the Synergy study, that is the natural history study. And then one has in, in um, green dotted line, I'm sorry, in the, in the six milligram per kilogram, in the, in the 
golden line, one can see the dosing of the high dose of vermorolone, where initially there was certainly much improvement in the BMI, although there was some deterioration of that as time went on. And in the green line, one can see really very static management of the BMI. So that was in the lower dose of the vomorolone. One saw significant improvement in BMI. This was also a very interesting part of the study, which at present has been unpublished and will be looked at further. And this is looking at sleep study on steroids and then um, looking at it on the vomorolone. So initially you can see that in the top two parts of this graph, there's a six-year-old boy and a five-year-old boy who were initially on the control trial with vomorolon. So we don't know what they were on at the beginning. We don't know whether it was placebo or whether it was um, steroid. It was thought that they were probably on prednisone at this point. And there was evidence that the sleep was, was disrupted. Then there was a crossover. And then one can see that the um, time to sleep, and this was using um, an actigraph that the boys wore overnight, one can see that there was improvement in their sleep quality, and that was the total sleep time, the time in bed, and this has been on a validated um, sleep quality study using the actigraph, and there looked like there was significant improvement, and this is going to be looked at in more detail on subsequent studies with Vomorolone. When you look at the um, bottom two, the sleep um, quality was staying the same throughout. So it's going to be very interesting as we go through the unblinding of this as to what those boys were on initially and what it was that actually improved this because we're just surmising what has happened um, at this point. When we look at the outcomes of those studies and we look at the percentage of children who developed Cushingoid or weight increase or hirsutism or discontinuation because of adverse events, um, one can see that all of those were much less in the Vomorolon group than in the prednisone group. And when we look at height, and I think what's so incredible when we look at the boys that we have here and we watch their growth, Really, when we start with regular steroids, we tend to find that the growth velocity and height centiles um, really change as soon as you start steroids. On the vomorolone group, the children have continued to grow at their regular centiles. So this has been really exciting. So what we're hoping to see and what's been put on a little bit of hold because of COVID has been looking at, at two other groups of children. That is boys between the ages of two and under four who have not thus far been treated. And also looking at boys who've been treated with steroids between the ages of seven to under 18. And for those boys going from prednisone or deflazacort to vermorolone or in children who have been steroid naive and to go on to vermorolone at that stage and then to continue with the transition onto some form of expanded access program. So we look forward to hearing more about this um, over these next few months. The next medication that I will briefly talk about is with Juvinostat from Pharmaco, which is an HDAC um, hyperactivity. And again, as we've mentioned before, it's part of the DMD pathogenesis. And Juvinostat is an inhibitor of this, and thus allowing for reduced fibrosis, which will hopefully allow for increased muscle mass and reduce the fibrosis and fat replacement that we see in DMD boys. It has been tolerated well with little in the way of what we've seen as side effects. There may be reduction in platelet counts, and that may be a dose-limiting factor in this, in this treatment. Juvenostat has been shown to counteract the pathogenic events downstream with that genetic effect from the dystrophin. And so hopefully we will see muscle regeneration and prevention of the muscle breakdown that we've seen to date. And so here we have enrolled boys between the ages of seven and 11. They have to be on a steady dose of steroids and they go into um, juvenostat versus placebo in a two to one ratio and are treated for 12 months. 
and the outcomes were measured with looking at muscle biopsies, which showed reduced fibrosis and and re reduction of the fat in the muscle, and also looking at lung function and the delay in median age of loss of ambulation. In the phase three study, um, again, we have been looking at these motor outcome measures and um, the same inclusion criteria here and the primary objectives being to see what the effects are of Givinistat versus placebo over 18 months and whether or not it slows the disease. And the secondary objectives looking at the pharmacokinetics and quality of life and the activities of daily living and obviously um, safety and tolerability. The primary endpoints in this study are the mean change in the fourth stair climb, and the secondary endpoints are the change in time to rise from the floor, or from the six minute walk test, as well as in the North Star, and looking at muscle strength. And as well, there is a cohort of MRI scans looking at the mean change in the vastus lateralis um, muscle in the fat fraction of that. One of the other drugs that we had been looking at was that of Edasa catabasis, which inhibits this NF kappa B and is a key driver in muscle disease in DMD. And this was an exciting molecule, but unfortunately, this phase three study has just recently been stopped because of lack of efficacy with no evidence of difference between the placebo and the control group on the North Star assessments. And there were also no um, evidence of improvement on the time to stand, this 10 meter walk run test or the four stair climb. And so again, although we have failed here to show benefit, it's really learning from this and, and moving on to look at other molecules. One of the other drugs that we've been uh, working with for some time has been uh, atelurin by PTC or Translarna, which has looked at protein restoration. And as you know, this has been a, a, a drug that's looked at individuals who had a nonsense mutation, which then caused premature halting in the synthesis of dystrophin. And it, it at present is an investigational drug. And they have come up with its stride registry, really to be able to capture evidence over time and to provide real world evidence of the benefits of what we can find with atelurin. One of the amazing things about this medication has really been its lack of side effects and it's been an incredibly safe drug. And so they're now doing an observational study of safety and efficacy through treat NMD and PTC. And some of this evidence was actually presented at the World Muscle Congress. And there's evidence from STRIDE, which has shown preservation of ambulation and physical function by probably more than three years compared to the Synergy Natural History Study. And there was also evidence of a trend to delay in the worsening of pulmonary function. Now, Atalurin is approved in certain countries in, in Europe, but unfortunately not so far in Canada. So in conclusion, it really, we are at a very exciting time in the advances of clinical care and research, and also a greater understanding of the pathological mechanisms and genetics that might lead to better function and better care and, and modifying the outcomes of boys with DMD. And certainly improved outcome possibly needs a combination of therapies. Early diagnosis is absolutely critical to all of this as it allows us to look after these boys with standards of care and these potential clinical trials much more readily. We want to collaborate with all of the stakeholders and that's really essential. And it's great to have the Canadian Neuromuscular Disease Registry to be able to look at real world evidence and to capture these index cases so that we can have much information as possible and allow clinical trial readiness of our children with DMD. Um, we want to be able to collaborate and to offer advocacy with the families and DMD supports and the supports with MDC are really vital. And over this last year, there's been the development of Neuromuscular Diseases for Canada, NMD4C, which really allows for national and international collaboration with all stakeholders. 
And I really look forward now to being able to um, hand over to uh, Dr. Jim Dowling. And um, Dr. Dowling is a senior scientist in genetics and in genome biology and is a staff physician at SickKids Hospital and an associate professor both in pediatrics, neurology and molecular genetics at University of Toronto. He did his undergraduate degree at Yale, his PhD at University of Chicago and is, um, has been very important in the development of NMD4C. He leads the translational research program. He has published numerous um, articles and journals and is, has had funding through CHR and through CERC, through the NIH and through Genome Canada. And he is the chair of the Canadian Pediatric Neuromuscular Group. And I am really excited to be able to introduce him today to um, talk to us more about where we're going with research in Canada. So over to you, Dr. Dowling. Great, thank you, Kathy. And uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for the invitation. Um, let's see, hopefully my screen is now shared. Yes. Um, excellent. Um, okay. so. Uh, I have the task today of uh, hopefully introducing some of the new therapeutic avenues that will be resulting in the next wave of therapies that um, hopefully are going to be making a big impact for uh, boys and men with uh, DMD. Um, and uh, I know a lot of this is going to be kind of adding on to the talks that you've uh, heard previously. Um, and so the areas where I think there's probably overlap, I will skip quickly through that. Um, I don't have any disclosures that uh, are relevant to today's talk, um, and so I'm going to launch right into it. Let me go to the uh, okay. Uh, so my goals today are to highlight some of the unique therapeutic strategies that are emerging for DMD, um, to review one one of the big challenges that I see for therapy, not just for DMD but for all muscle diseases which is the challenge of delivery to the skeletal muscle, and then present some of the new approaches that are being utilized to identify new drug targets. Not necessarily talk about the targets that they're finding, but rather the, these uh, exciting new strategies that I think are going to provide our next wave of, of drug targets. So I wanted to first talk about cell therapy, which uh, is both a new and an old concept. Uh, it was actually one of the very first uh, therapies tried for Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, by Lou Kunkel and colleagues many years ago uh, with intramuscular injections of myoblasts uh, as an attempt at therapy. Uh, the field has evolved quite a bit since then. Um, and now uh, I think there's real hope that a cell-based type strategy could be something that could be uh, applied as an effective therapy uh, for Duchenne. Uh, so this is from a recent review article by Catherine Wagner, who is an expert in cell therapy uh, and also generally a clinical expert in DMD. Um, and what this slide highlights is a couple of things. One is that there are a couple of different potential sources to provide uh, for cell therapies for treating Duchenne. Um, and the idea is that uh, it turns out that many different types of cells can potentially uh, be converted into muscle uh, or can populate the muscle and then make new muscle fibers. Um, so uh, it's been recognized that some, uh, some blood cells, uh, so for example, from bone marrow transplantation can uh, provide precursors for muscle. And if they can successfully get to the muscle can then uh, change into myofibers. Um, also uh, some cell types such as parasites uh, can accomplish that same uh, ability. Uh, and probably the most excitement relates to something called uh, induced pluripotent stem cells or IPS cells. Um, and these are cells that are derived from individual patients uh, that can be converted into a um, stem cell state and then changed into pretty much any type of cell uh, in the body um, through a, a process of what's called reprogramming and differentiation. And the idea here is that one can uh, take cell types, potentially, for example, from a skin biopsy, turn those back into uh, stem cells through this uh, um, de-differentiation process, 
and then add factors that would turn them in first to myoblasts and then into myotubes, and then potentially deliver those uh, to, uh, to patients as a way of replacing uh, or uh, adding to existing muscle. The excitement related to this, uh, in addition, is that one can modify uh, very easily these iPS cells and, for example, use technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 to, to correct gene mutations uh, um, and then uh, add the cells back. So just to talk a little about what the current state of the cell therapy field is. Um, so the strengths are, as you can imagine, it's, it's a pretty attractive thing to think about actually adding new muscle back. Um, and uh, replacing existing damaged muscle with new healthy muscle. Um, and in particular, if this new healthy muscle can have a full length dystrophin. Um, the other uh, attractive part, particularly of the uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, is that these can be taken from an individual and added back, so um, can evade problems related to the immune system. And we can use technologies again, like CRISPR-Cas9 to correct mutations in cells. There are still a lot of challenges related to uh, stem cell or to cell therapy. Um, one is that um, the field is still trying to figure out the best way to turn stem cells into myoblasts um, and also what the best source for stem cells would be, whether that's skin fibroblasts, uh, cells from the blood, cells from the bone marrow, things like that. Um, probably the biggest challenge is then figuring out once you have a suitable cell type, how to get those delivered throughout the body so that a sufficient number of muscles are targeted uh, that the therapy would be meaningful. And also there's been persistent problems with uh, survival and engraftment of these cells into the muscle. And there's still some hurdles to be overcome there. And finally, there are some challenges related specifically to the idea of using CRISPR to repair uh, mutations in patient cells uh, to optimize the repair process uh, to make it as efficient and safe as possible. which is a good segue into uh, the next sort of big hitting topic I wanted to bring up, which is uh, gene editing based strategies. And gene editing, I'm really referring to the things that are uh, related to CRISPR-Cas9 and what has evolved from there. Um, so the basic idea, and this is um, co-opting a natural bacterial defense system uh, for use as a potential therapeutic, uh, and it has two major components. One is the enzyme or protein component, which is in the case of the schematic, the Cas9. And the other is the, the guiding component, uh, which is the part that guides the Cas9 to the specific part of the DNA or RNA molecule in order to enact the change that one wants to see. So when this first technology, uh, when this technology first came on the scene as a potential therapeutic, uh, it came in the form of looking at uh, CRISPR-Cas9, so the Cas9 enzyme, and using uh, the CRISPR-based uh, guide system. Um, and the idea is that with these uh, guides to lead CRISPR to the target, you can make cuts in the DNA, and those cuts can either remove some sequence uh, as a means of, for example, interrupting an exon to promote exon skipping, or they can be a source for repairing uh, DNA. So you can cut and then repair as a way of correcting mutations. The technology has evolved quite a bit. Uh, there's several different types of Cas9s that have now been made. They can have different functionality as well as some different related uh, enzymes that can, that can perform different functions. And so now it's not only possible to do these uh, cut and repair, uh, but also um, there's specific strategies um, and new technologies, for example, called base editors uh, which can change a specific one of the base pair letters uh, to correct a mutation, or prime editing, which can uh, really find many uh, or almost all areas in the genome and uh, do a cut and repair process. Uh, and so on the right panel, you can see some of the potential utilities of this gene editing system. Uh, the first uh, types of strategies that have really been moving forward for Duchenne uh, have essentially been using CRISPR-Cas9 to recapitulate the effects of uh, antisense oligos to accomplish exon skipping. Uh, so you can imagine that if you can make a cut uh, and remove some sequence, you can uh, create the same effect you would with a something that blocks uh, RNA splicing in order to create an exon skipping event uh, to basically accomplish the same thing, but 
on a persistent basis um, as you would get with an exon skipping molecule. Uh, and this can be done either with two cuts because you can imagine you can cut on either side of an exon to remove it, or you can make a cut right at uh, 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 one part of the sequence to prevent that exon from being included so that uh, you can accomplish exon skipping. These newer uh, strategies, um, including base editing, prime editing, offer the potential for specific mutation correction, um, which is in some ways the, the holy grail of gene editing, where you can take an individual who has a, a single or multi-base pair change that is causing a gene mutation and uh, use these strategies to correct it back to the normal sequence. So to summarize the current state of the CRISPR field, um, so CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing has several strengths. Uh, so I'm stealing this analogy from David Liu, who's a professor in California, who's one of the gurus of CRISPR-Cas9 editing. Uh, and he likens the three general strategies to the following. So the CRISPR-Cas9 strategy that was first identified and described uh, for as a potential therapeutic uh, is considered like a scissors. So you can cut things out basically with it. Um, the uh, relatively newer base editing technology is like a pencil. You can erase and rewrite. And then the prime editors, which are probably uh, the most excitement, but also the furthest from the clinic are like a word processor. You can whole scale change uh, parts of the genetic material. Uh, so in terms of strategies, uh, the one uh, strategy that is moving forward and probably closest to the clinic in terms of clinical trial is exon skipping um, or exon remodeling using uh, this conventional Cas9 and one or two of these guiding RNAs. Um, and as I mentioned, the precise mutation correction with either base editing or prime editing is still in the preclinical phase being tested in models of DMD. And finally, people are co-opting this CRISPR-Cas9 system as a means of enacting other type of genetic changes. Uh, so for example, uh, my uh, colleague at SickKids, Ronnie Cohn, has used this CRISPR system to upregulate the eutrophin gene uh, in a very powerful way of, of enacting this change uh, that, we, uh, that has been known to be in a potentially effective therapeutic strategy for DMD, but has not been able to be successfully accomplished with small molecules. So this sounds like a very promising avenue, uh, but there's still many challenges that need to be overcome uh, for this to be a viable therapeutic. Um, in terms of the conventional CRISPR-Cas9 that was originally uh, advancing towards the clinic, one of the big challenges is that the uh, edits or cuts that the scissor makes in the genome uh, are a little bit difficult to predict and aren't always the same and precise. So you can get some insertion of genetic material or deletion of genetic material more than you might anticipate or predict. Um, and it can also occur not just at the site that you're targeting it, but potentially at other sites as well. Um, as with the DMD gene in general, uh, there, these things need to be delivered to the muscle cell. The current strategy is considering using an AAV-based technology as with microdystrophin. And it encounters the same problems in that there's a size limitation. And so these Cas9 enzymes can only uh, be packaged uh, so well. And in particular, these newer enzymes that do the base editing and the prime editing are very big and have to be in fact put into two different AAV packages in order to be effectively delivered. Um, right now also there's some concerns about the low efficiency of the editing. Uh, so even if you can deliver it into the muscle, how many of the DNA copies in a muscle cell get, uh, or in a muscle fiber get sufficiently and, uh, and accurately edited. Again, I already mentioned the off-target problems. And then there is the issue of the fact that you're introducing a, a, a foreign protein. This Cas9 is not something that humans normally make. So there's the potential for immune reaction to it. So as I highlighted with the CRISPR-Cas uh, editing strategy, one of the key challenges right now for therapeutics is delivery to the muscle. Um, and this has probably been the key limitation to um, the antisense oligonucleotide exon skipping strategies. And one of the things that has resulted in the results from these trials being probably uh, less uh, impactful than would have uh, hoped uh, given the theory of the strategy. So there are many new, strat uh, many new technologies and approaches that are being looked at to overcome this. 
Um, one is the potential of adding uh, the antisense oligos or the exon skippers uh, into an AAV vector-based delivery package uh, and therefore uh, being able to give them uh, in a much more effective manner. Um, and this is actually something that um, is uh, on the cusp of clinical trial right now, uh, which is using AAV strategy to deliver uh, exon skippers. Um, another active area of research is to modify these existing exon skippers to make them more effective, either to put a modification on them so that they better target the muscle or change the chemistry so that they're more stable and or more potent. Um, and, and this has already been seen with some of the new generation of exon skippers that have entered the clinical trial. And I anticipate that we'll continue to see evolution uh, of this technology over time. Um, so right now the current state of delivery uh, the optimal uh, agents are the viral vectors, such as the AAVs, including AAV8 and 9, and the proprietary AAV uh, that Dr. Mendel spoke about um, for the sereptogene therapy trial. Um, these are very good at delivering uh, uh, proteins and RNAs and DNAs to skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, at least in young, particularly in younger children, there's a low rate of anti-AAV. So most uh, individuals are able to receive the therapy. Um, it's becoming clear from many clinical trials now that there is dose dependent side effects related to AAVs, particularly in terms of liver toxicity and thrombocytopenia. And this dose dependent side effects uh, limits not only how much can be given to any individual, but also uh, limits potentially the age and size of individuals who could receive an effective dose of gene therapy. There's also limitations in terms of what can be put into AAVs. There's only a certain amount of genetic material that can be packaged, um, and that provides important limitations and is the reason why, uh, for example, that gene therapy uses a microdystrophin as opposed to the full dystrophin. Uh, there's also the challenge that, it, based on the current technology, is only the ability to dose a single time with an AAV due to immune response. Um, so there's many strategies they're looking at modifying AAVs to increase packaging size, to potentially uh, enable multiple dosing um, and to diminish uh, the side effects. There's also some strategies emerging uh, for different avenues for delivery and two of the most exciting of which are uh, exosomes, which are naturally occurring cellular compartments that cells shed normally uh, and that contain uh, uh, DNAs and proteins. Um, and so the idea is to co-opt these normally occurring uh, cellular structures, uh, which can package in large amounts of material uh, and use them to put in, for example, the DMD gene uh, and use that as a means of delivery. Uh, exosomes are also being considered um, for packaging CRISPR-Cas9 contents. Um, Nanoparticles similarly are lipid-based particles that can be synthesized um, synthetically uh, and can potentially have a large carrier capacity. Um, there is some concern with both these strategies in terms of uh, immune response, and they're still in the preclinical stage of development. Um, but uh, there is a lot of excitement about this possibility in terms of using them to deliver therapeutics. Um, so I'm going to skip this because you already had talks on gene therapy. Um, and then I'm gonna finally end by talking about some of the newer strategies related to drug development uh, that I think are quite exciting. Um, and these are really uh, based on non-biased drug screening technologies. Um, and I'm gonna highlight two. Uh, one is again, using these, cell, these cells that I mentioned before, these IPS or induced pluripotent stem cells, um, which can be again, derived from uh, patient skin biopsies or uh, from other cell compartments from individuals uh, and then turned first into a stem cell, meaning uh, that has the potential to become many different types of cells and then converted into muscle. Um, and these uh, muscle-like cells made from pluripotent stem cells are ideal for doing large-scale drug screens. And the first round of such screens are really emerging now. Uh, and the beauty is again, now you're screening something that is very patient adjacent because it um, often has come from an individual uh, or several individuals with DMD uh, and contains therefore all of the um, normal proteins and changes uh, that would be seen in human muscle um, as opposed to an animal, which is gonna have important differences to humans. Um, and 
there's been now been several phenotypes or changes in these cells that have been identified that are suitable for doing drug screens. So I anticipate that these screens are going to produce some uh, uh, interesting and new drug candidates uh, that will be uh, helpful for uh, future therapies. Um, Dr. Selby mentioned the HDAC inhibitors, and there's been uh, an interesting or there's an interesting study ongoing to look at um, HDAC inhibitors and how they influence these iPS cells as one example of drugs potentially emerging. Um, another is a, a favorite of mine because this is something that my lab does quite a bit of, uh, which is using the zebrafish as a model system for rapid and large scale drug discovery. Um, this is not a new concept and there's actually been several drug screens now performed uh, in uh, zebrafish models. Um, and um, the reason why they're attractive is because they uh, can uh, enable a whole animal drug screen, which isn't feasible in a larger animal like a mouse, um, and yet have the biology that's very similar to human muscle. Uh, and so there are now uh, been several effective drug screens done using zebrafish models, and I anticipate um, they'll continue to be a source of identifying uh, new and um, potentially exciting therapies. Uh, the final avenue is one that I think also holds great promise, which is the idea of using genetic modification as a springboard for therapy development. And so here the idea is either using an animal model or, or uh, patient comparisons, uh, figuring out the non-DMD genetic drivers that results in the variation in clinical presentations. Um, so a classic example of this is the group of uh, Elizabeth McNally and Eric Hoffman several years ago identified changes um, in the osteopontin gene related to um, individuals who either lost ambulation early or lost ambulation late. Uh, and by looking at the genetic differences between those two groups, found that there was a specific uh, gene that could help predict that difference and understanding the function of that gene and the variation in, in, in its gene sequence has enabled the rational development of new therapies. Uh, this is a similar study done by Lou Kunkel's group where they looked at some of the genetic drivers that cause differences in the phenotypic presentation of the DMD dog model. Um, and it's, it's known there's quite a bit of variability between individual dogs with DMD mutations. Um, and what they looked at is they used the RNA uh, from the muscle of these dogs and said, well, what are the differences in the animals that either have a normal, uh, relatively normal presentation, who have a severe presentation or have a very mild presentation? And can those differences uh, identify something we could use as a therapy? Um, and this was their initial foray into it where they looked at some of the genes uh, that were differentially uh, changed in these conditions. So for example, here's one of these genes and you can see it has very low levels in the quote unquote escapers. So these are the, the dogs that had a uh, very mild phenotype uh, versus the uh, dogs that have a very severe phenotype. And they're now developing a therapeutic strategy based on modulation of this PIT PNA gene. Uh, the idea being that because it's at such low levels in the escaper animals that if one could reduce the levels of this, uh, that might be a potential therapeutic strategy. Uh, so I think that because this is using the, the natural biology uh, that's dictating or driving differences in clinical presentation, uh, that it's a quite promising strategy for identifying new therapies. Uh, my final slide is something that uh, Dr. Selby went over in quite a bit of detail, so I'm not going to mention it, uh, which is all of the emerging small molecule strategies. Um, I count over 50 uh, either actively recruiting uh, or soon to start clinical trials, and I know of several others that are in preparation. Uh, so I think it is a uh, very exciting time in the therapy development world for DMD. And I also think that uh, there are going to be even better therapeutic candidates uh, coming down the pipeline with these new strategies for identifying and translating them. And so I'm gonna stop there. I think I'm hopefully in the 15 minutes uh, and enable us to get to the, uh, to the coffee question and answer sessions. Dr. Donnelly, I'd like to thank you very much for putting all of these really exciting um, sort of new generation therapies and their potentials for uh, hopefully will be coming available in the next few years. And um, I'd like to thank you very much for putting that together so clearly and look forward to Rochelle telling us the next bit of the agenda here. <laughs>
Thank you so much, everyone. That was a wonderful session. Uh, for the attendees that are still with us, we are running a little bit of, uh, you know, behind schedule. Um, and so what we're going to do right now is, you know, the speakers for the next session um, are ready to begin. Um, but we also want to honor your time during your coffee break with Dr. Dowling and Dr. Selby. So what we're going to ask is Dr. Selby and Dr. Dowling, if you're okay to continue with your coffee break, go into your room. Uh, and for those attendees that would like to have that one-on-one -on -one time with the two specialists, by all means, this is a great opportunity to have that. Maybe, you know, your one opportunity to do that. Uh, so I would highly encourage you to do that. We are going to start the other session, Living a Healthy Lifestyle, um, immediately after after this session. Just note that it is recorded. So if you do want to take your time having questions and answers with Dr. Dowling and Dr. Selby, please feel free to do so. Um, and then if you want to join us directly after this into the Living a Healthy Lifestyle session, you can also do that as well. You have a choice at this point as to where you'd like to go, but just know that the next keynote session will be recorded and shared after today's event. All right, so I will end this session and uh, everyone, we will look forward to seeing you either in the coffee break or in the next session, Living a Healthy Lifestyle. Thank you so much.